I think I know most everybody here, but for those I don't know who are very few, I'm Dick Bernstein, and I teach philosophy at the New School. Uh, I really don't want to give a talk about this. I'd much rather, I, I, this is the third time I've seen the movie, and uh, I know that people always have questions. So I would much rather respond to questions. I just want to say uh, a couple of things. Uh, about this, or a few things, just to give you a chance to think of the questions is that you might want to ask. Um, uh, this is not a documentary, and that means there are certain scenes in it that are fictional. Uh, it turns out that about 75% of the dialogue is authentic. That is, it comes from letters or talks that she gave. There are a lot of little touches that uh, are really quite true to it. Mary McCarthy would always bring her flowers. So a little touch like that. Uh, the relationship with her husband, Heinrich, is quite authentic. And the German speakers, I'm sure, picked up the way they called each other in nicknames. Uh, some of you may have noticed that on her desk there were two pictures. One was Heidegger and the other was Heinrich. So those things are, in fact, uh, personally, I knew Hannah. I knew her after this period. I knew Mary McCarthy. I knew Hans Jonas. I knew Laura Jonas. And I knew Lottie. So I knew a number of the characters that are in the movie. I also knew, knew two of the people who helped advise in making uh, uh, the movie. In my opinion, I think Margarita von Trotter did a remark. She really read it carefully. There are things that are revealed in this movie that only our rent scholars would know, and you may not have even caught. Uh, for example, uh, it is true that Hannah Rent was put in an, in an internment camp in France, uh, and what is not fully brought out is only when the Nazis marched in that she escaped from this camp. Uh, she says she escaped with a toothbrush. She had also, there's something that's not revealed. She had done some work for Kurt, the, uh, for the Jew, German Zionists in Berlin in uh, 1933. She's born in 1906, so that's in her 20s. And she was apprehended and interrogated by the Gestapo for eight days and released. Many people were buried, were killed in the basements of it, and that's when she escaped Germany illegally through Prague, and then Geneva made her way to Paris. So little touches like that. Uh, it took me, I mean, I've written a book on Hannah Arendt and deal with this period, so I know a lot uh, about it. There is one thing that I think ought to be said to the trustees of the new school you would get the impression, because they show this building, that all this academic uh, affairs took place at the new school. But the truth of the matter is, you, David said it, but people I'm sure did not pick it up, Hannah Arendt was not teaching at the new school during the period that this movie is written. It's only what the trustees should know. The controversy is authentic. For example, the two notes of hate letters those are actual notes that were written to her uh, in it. So that's the kinds of touch. That, that, but it, she was hired only permanently. She did teach in this division occasionally in the 50s, but it's in, only in 1967 that she was actually hired by it. So the trustees, I think, come off quite well <laughs> because they hired her as a member of the faculty uh, at that time. Indeed, they did something very nice. She died in 1975. Uh, and just before, there was the issue, she, because she only taught here for seven years, she did not have a pension. And the news, the trustees made an agreement to give her a pension, which she never got really to use, because she died when she was still, still teaching. So there's a little touches in, in this, and uh, whatever questions you want to ask, about the characters or what really happened. The other thing, there were two things that are, t touched me that are really authentic. Um, Mary McCarthy did not look like Janet McTeer. 
Mary McCarthy was a small, slight person. And Barbara Sokolov does not look like Hannah, although I think it's a very good portrait. Hannah was really like that, you know. And I like the touches that show her humor and her relationship with her husband, because there is, if I had time and world enough when we end, I'll even tell the wonderful story of how I got to meet Hannah, which was uh, actually only three years before her death, but I was very, we were very close. Uh, the other thing that touches me is that Hannah, the one thing that really does look like Hannah is the 18-year-old Hannah. That's what she looked like when she was 18 years old and met Heidegger. But they don't tell you Heidegger at that time was married, had two children, and had this affair with her when she was 18. And the other thing that touched me is I've been in that apartment. Uh, the Riverside apartment, and it's not really a replica, but the feel of it is like that. And in that little room, which is the central room, I was served dinner by Hannah Rent uh, a couple of times. So there are certain touches that are, you know, although I think Margarita did an imaginative treatment, she's not doing it, so that some things that Heidegger says, in, presumably said in 1924, he only said in 1970, or when she has a conversation with uh, Kurt Blumenthal about that I, about I love only my friends, that appeared in a letter to Gershon, Gershon Sherlock. So it's a little disconcerting the first time I saw it, knowing where all this comes from. But if you think that this is an imaginative attempt to get at, and it's a very sympathetic portrayal. There are a lot of people who are a lot less sympathetic to in, uh, in this, but uh, this is very close to the Hana that I knew. So from there on, I'll take questions. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Who, what university was that being depicted? Well, it, it's really a, a, a uh, really a conglomeration. Oh. Uh, for example, you remember the scene at the end where she's in a dining room and nobody is sitting with her? That happened at the University of Chicago. The main place she was teaching in those years and Hunter went, up until she came to the school, was never a full-time academic. She was on the Committee of Social Thought in Chicago, uh, Chicago, and uh, so that scene happened at Chicago. But it's a blending of when she, uh, Thursday, I go to Wesleyan, because they're celebrating the 50th anniversary. She was at Wesleyan <coughs> as a humanities fellow when she went, when the, where she wrote part of the Eichmann book. So it's a blending of Wesleyan, um, Bard, and the university, but none of it is really quite as authentic. I mean, you can see this, we were a kind of imaginative person. She couldn't deal with all the academic connection, so she gives this thing. And I have to tell you something interesting. I asked my friend Jerry Cohn, who was an advisor of the movie, because I didn't read it this way, but you could read it that, you know, the bad guys is a new school. And he wrote to me that actually, you know, he thought that they shouldn't have had that scene, but that really I think that Margarita wanted to do homage to the new school. She didn't want to interpret it in a bad way because to this day, Hannah Arendt is really associated with us, with the new school. People come still from all over the world to look at the archive. Uh, yeah. Was there controversy oh, over publishing the uh, the banality book and who published it? And Yeah. Well, the, the way it really went, I mean, a lot of this is, it is true. She asked William Sean, she had been writing some things for the New Yorker. So that is William Sean, the real editor of the New Yorker at that time. And Larry Ross is a person who was rumored to be his mistress, who was the other person working at the New York, that's the, the um, and uh, my favorite scene in the whole thing is when he says, but this is Greek, and our readers don't know it, and she, that is absolutely typical of Hannah. They should learn it, <laughs> you know, and it appeared, and it did appear as a five-part article in the New, York, uh, New Yorker, and subsequently was published by Viking. Uh, at that, uh, particular time. Uh, one fact is that everybody knows the phrase, the banality of evil. In the actual book, it only appears one time, that phrase. Only once at the end, the very last sentence, when she uh, is describing the way in which Heitman uh, uh, <clears throat> went to his death. It was even now, 
the book has a subtitle, Eichmann in Jerusalem, I have it right here, a report on the banality of evil. But that, a report on the banality of evil was not in the New Yorker. It was just a reporter at large series at that time. And, but the story of the controversy, and that the controversy happened even before the book was published. Uh, a scene like, remember when she's accosted on the road? Well, okay, here's where you see uh, fiction and reality. Siegfried Moses is a real person, and he was, really did. They, there was a concerted effort for her not to publish the book. But it didn't happen that they came on a road that way. It was really actually intended aesthetically to be a compliment to the capture of Eichmann that you see in the very beginning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was sort of interested in uh, her attitude to Martin Heidegger. I was surprised that she continued to have his picture on her desk yeah. as late as the time of this, of this right. film. I'm interested in your views on that. Right. Uh, this is a complicated exists. issue. First of all, I think that one has to realize that the affair is when she's 18, 19 years old. This is much more in that kind of erotic, in the days when professors would seduce things. This is way before, this is 1924, 25. So this is not before any indication of his uh, sympathies with the Nazis and before that. Now, the thing that is much more controversial and there are many nasty things she has to say about Heidegger. At one point, she almost virtually accuses him of being a murderer. She had no contact with Heidegger from 1933 until 1949 was her first trip back to Germany where she was working for Jewish organizations. And she was uh, in Freiburg, where he then was, and she dropped him a note that she was, and he came immediately when you see him coming to the hotel. The one scene that's fictional is, why don't you say something, uh, Heider? Uh, and they then reestablished relations. They wrote to each other. Uh, Hanno's view of Heidegger, and many people have that view, is that he was the greatest thinker of the 20th century. You know? And I would say, although I'm not an admirer of Heidegger, he was the greatest teacher. If you use as a criterion, as a teacher, a person who turns out students who are independent, nobody comes equals Heidegger in terms of the students that he, uh, uh, who did original work, including Hans Jonas. Hans Jonas was a friend of, uh, of Hannah from 1924. And although he's not in the classroom listening to that lecture, that's fiction, he broke with her. He wouldn't speak to Hannah for two years after the book. Uh, and it was Laura that finally brought them together and they made the agreement from then on never to speak about the book. But they had been long friends. Uh, and so you get, those are the, the touches. Now, uh, uh, I think, I mean, it would be a long, I'd have to go into a long issue about what I, a, about the complications of, of this thing. There are interesting details, like, uh, uh, it wasn't well known that she had an affair with Heidegger during her lifetime. It was only when Elizabeth Young Brew wrote the biography that it was even indicated. Hannah Arendt was a person who treated her private life very, very exclusively from the public life. But she kept all the letters from Heidegger and she gave them to Marbach, to a library. So she knew that someday the whole story would be told. Now, you make up, and she kept those letters, letters in in her own bedroom. So, from there on, you have to make your own inferences. Yeah, there are some people who are very critical of her, for not uh, because she could be very sharp and very critical of it. And she helped to create. Uh, I don't want to get into this in great detail, but what I think is the Heidegger myth. The Heidegger myth is that he made a mistake in 1933. And when he realized the mistake, by the way, it is true, he did resign, that he then retreated to thinking, which is what he did. But she's in the movie, when he says he didn't know anything about politics, it's certainly true. But uh, so the, what we now know 
is that Heidegger let himself be associated with the Nazis for a much longer period beyond 33. But that's, so it gets complicated from here on. I mean, to me, to simply condemn Heidegger because he was a Nazi, he, he was such an original thinker, is wrong, even though, I mean, my attitude is Heidegger was, was a great philosopher and a moral bastard. You know, he lacked courage. What? Said was the greatest teacher. I've never heard that said about Well, him. you think of, you know one of his, his students? I don't know. Han Arendt? Hans Jonas? Leo Strauss? Yes. You know, Hans George Gadamer? Martin, you know, it, the interesting thing, it's Jews and non-Jews, right and left. Herbert Marcuse was a great student. You take that combination, that's a knockout combination of people. And they were all students of Heidegger in this period. Right. Yeah. There's not a word, no feeling that there is background in family in, in, her, in her life. Well, uh, I think that the, I mean, that was, I guess, a decision of the director. The truth is, they do reveal a little thing. Her father died when she was quite young. Uh, she was actually born in, in Hanover, then brought up in Kernisberg you know, herself, and of course lived in Germany until she, 1933, yeah, you know. Um, she then, the person who did survive was her mother. And uh, they don't have anything about the mother. And in fact, what was interesting is that <clears throat> when this order, when, when the, the French you know, they, they weren't putting Jews. It was German exiles, which meant Jews. The order came in 1940. Men go to one camp, women go to another camp. Women over 55 were allowed to stay in Paris. Hannah Arendt makes a lot about good fortune, and she was very lucky. She was lucky not to be killed in the basement of the Gestapo. She was lucky to survive gurus. She was lucky, it's Varian von Frey, you know, who was the person who arranged for lots of the visas to get a visa. And she was lucky to be able to cross, I mean, in order to get to the United States, you had to cross in the Spanish border, cross Spain into Portugal. And at this particular point in 40, in 41, it wasn't the Spanish that caused difficulty, it was the French who have an ex exit visa. So there is a sense in which she was stateless, for 18 years, and that is a major theme in her own philosophical work. I mean, for my own self, uh, I, I was a person who was interested in her philosophy and her thoughts, and I won't, it was almost an accident that I got to write a book about her, but the, when I did, and I saw, I mean, the question in my mind was this. Her famous book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, was published in 1951. Okay, that means she's 45. What was she was writing from the, from the time she was 20. Almost all of what she wrote about had to do with Jewish issues at that time. And she worked for various organizations. She worked for uh, Youth Aliyah in Paris. She, was, uh, she actually wrote Origins of Totalitarianism. She was not when she was uh, working for Schocken, Schocken Press which was originally a press, you know, from Germany that went to Israel and that was here. So, uh, and she was part of, the reason she went to Europe in 1949 is she was working for an organization that was concerned with Jewish artifacts in Europe, cataloging them after the Second World War. So all this, and she's writing for, uh, I don't know, Henry, did you know the, the journal Aufbau? She wrote for, she was a regular writer for Aufbau. Aufbau is a, uh, was a kind of um, uh, um, a, a, news, a periodical in German that was published in New York, mainly directed to a German Jewish audience. What? Mainly refugees. Mainly, oh yes. I mean, who would know German in this? It was not going to Germany, you know, thing. And she was, she strongly identified with Zionism for many, many years, she broke with the Zionists on the issue of the Arabs. That's what she did. I mean, what she wrote in the 40s is really quite remarkable because she, it's, it's disturbingly prophetic about what she thought. She was uh, identified with the group 
in Israel that was called Ichud Unity. This was a group of people who did not want a Jewish state, but a Jewish homeland, wanted a binational state. There was a thing, and she strongly he was involved in that organization. I mean, it, it's a complicated story, but a very interesting uh, story. So she was one, which she felt, for those who know anything about the history of Zionist organizations, that increasingly, that the what the call that it was the revisionists as they were called the more extreme the irgun that was winning out, and that uh, in the, the uh, and that when it was no longer being recognized. I mean, this is what you I will quote something that you wrote in 1948. There will never be peace in the Middle East unless Arabs and Jews sit down and negotiate together. That's a quote. Uh, so she was very much involved in, in these things. And sure, I mean, and when we get to the Eichmann book, uh, the thing, I mean, she's right that many people were criticizing the book she never wrote. She, she defended the right of Israel to kidnap Eichmann, as he was. She defended, it was a long discussion before the trial about whether he should be tried in uh, Israel. She defended the right of Israel to try it, even though Israel didn't exist at the time that the crimes were committed. And she ultimately defended, is a beautiful thing, defended the judgment of the, one part of the, of the judges. You see, I mean, what she was so, that was, by the way, I hope you realize that the uh, black and white is all footage, actual footage, and that's, you know, so that's, that's actual, the argument. And it is, she was very critical of the uh, Gideon House, the prosecutor, because he, he was melodramatic. I mean, they quote the P.T. he began with Haman, and that this is now, I mean, the, the truth is, you see, nobody ever established, and the judges recognize this, that Eichmann physically murdered anybody. I mean, this, this is not, he was, they refer to his department, he was involved in Jewish affairs, he was the one who was involved in transporting them him about this. And what uh, Arendt felt, that there's a lot of discussion about this, what they did in this trial is completely open up. There were no rules of evidence. It became, it was really, it is true, that it was taken as an opportunity to tell the Jewish story. So you have all these people just telling their story. I mean, there's like one incident. They go through the whole 20 volumes about what happened in Poland and in the thing. And, and the, uh, the defense lawyer, who was, who was a German but not very good, is the name Adolf Eichmann mentioned once in these 24 volumes? And the answer was no. So this is what offended her. She argues, and it comes out in there, that a trial, you know, is whether a person is guilty of the charges brought against him. But she did think, she did say, and it's quoted, that Eichmann was one of the greatest criminals. And in the end, there was a great deal of controversy whether he should actually be hung, and she defended that. And she defended this so that the idea of her being a self-hating Jew or exonerating Eichmann and so forth is not. Now, uh, they mention, I think it's a lot of courage because they quote in the movie perhaps the most controversial passage from the book about the Jewish councils. They actually quote that passage that she wrote, and the passage is offensive. Nobody knows how many Jews would be killed if there weren't the case, but the truth is, I've done a lot of work on the Jewish count. It's a very dark story. I mean, it is the case that there were, all, there were members of the council who committed suicide rather than do it. There were those who assumed kinds of power which he objected to, it, and is absolutely true. No, no one would ever deny he, that if, they, if the Nazis would have had to use a great deal more manpower to run the ghettos and to, if there hadn't been so much, I mean, because they collected all the data, they ran things in itself, and where, where did she want to draw the line? Uh, she gave a very interesting interview afterwards. She would draw through the line is when members of the council are deciding who shall live and who shall die. Who shall go to Auschwitz and should now? That, she thought, 
was the limit. So it's not, I mean, she never should have said the things she said in quite the voice, and she, if she's going to raise that issue, she should have did that in much more detail. Do you remember there is something in the Eichmann trial where there is an outburst against, well, that was Freudinger, who was the head of the Jewish Council in Hungary. And, you know, this is one of the worst stories, because in March of 1944, everybody knew that Germans were going to lose. The only last great population of Jews was in, 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 in Hungary. And at that point, I mean, and so everybody knew this. Here, I think, uh, I think she's not quite right about Eichmann because Eichmann organized the council between March of '44 and the following fall. Four hundred thousand Jews were sent to Auschwitz, and that was organized ultimately by Eichmann and his team. In, in team. And one other thing is here, and it is the case that Freud. Remember, he gives his defense. He says, I mean, that the, uh, why didn't we tell them? There was nothing to, that could be done. They couldn't escape. And that person has the outburst. I mean, there were many Hungarians who thought that the council had betrayed them in, in this. So it's a very, it's an issue that needs a lot of nuance. And there isn't nuance in the book. But in 1960, when the book is written, or when the articles appeared, where people forget sometimes, A, what was so interesting is how little discussion of, of what we can now call the Holocaust really existed publicly. She, it's as if she broke a taboo. New York intellectuals were not talking about that. They were talking about Dylan Thomas and so forth. Uh, uh, B, the word Holocaust was not popularized. It's only, that's only a phenomenon of the late 60s. Is. So, and although scholars knew, and people who had been involved with councils knew, because there had been a famous trial in Israel about Kasta, uh, Kasta this is not something that was publicly discussed. I mean, it was the attitude, victims are innocent, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, this, this is, uh, well, I will now give my own interpretation. You see, I think the most interesting thing that emerges from this book about evil, and you know I've written about this, is she said something that people don't want to hear. That perfectly ordinary people can get caught up and do monstrous deeds without really stopping to think about what they're doing. That's what you I mean. The way we think, you think about it at any time of crisis, you know, whether it be you know, whether it be 9-11 and so forth, it, the ease is they're either the sadistic villains or innocent people. And I think that our Hunterman's message, you won't understand evil after the totalitarianism. You can't think in those categories. They're too simplistic. No, thank that, that That's Bernstein on Hunter Rent, but that's what she says too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can you explain the remark when she's looking out of the window near the end, the difference between radical and extreme? Yes. It was the one thing I didn't understand. Well, okay. Uh, I don't want to take, as I say, you have to be careful I don't give a lecture. Do you remember that there is, she's teaching a class in German. And that is quotation from her book on the origins of totalitarianism. And there she used the term radical evil. And what she wanted to describe, what she said, um, in effect, it wasn't simply the number of people. There had been massacres before. But the systematic attempt to try to make human beings into something that they're not, not human. That's what she thought was worse. And that's what she called, in that book, radical evil. OK? Uh, uh, Hunter Rent is a person who is enormously sensitive to language. And when she uses the term radical, she doesn't mean just to, you know, think. She's thinking of it in terms of uh, radix, the Latin word going to roots. Okay? Now, the mistake that she says, it's not that she changed her mind about what she had said, but she didn't think it was right to describe it as radical evil because there is no depths. She said that evil is on the surface. 
and can spread like a fungus over the whole world. So the issue, some people think that she was rejecting her earlier view. She wasn't rejecting it, but she was rejecting the idea that there's something deep and profound that you have to get at to get at evil, when what is so scary about evil is that it could be just on the surface. And that's why she said, evil is not radical, it's extreme. Yeah. Well, okay, it's, it's a long evening, but I'm happy. I mean, for me, I could talk for the next three hours, but you can't stay here. Yeah, do you want to ask a question? Uh, Oh, was so deferential to her. He was. Particularly in that issue about the Jews that they were... Right. And why was that? I think that... Uh, for, I mean, the relationship there. You know, are you pressuring me? You know, saying, there was a deferential attitude. By this time, uh, Hunter Rent was really considered one of the leading New York intellectuals. And he had a lot of respect for her. Um, I mean, he was being pressured by his own staff to edit it. But in the end, she was insistent. I mean, uh, there is another thing that I think you can fault Hunter with. And they try to bring that out in the movie. I think when Mary asked her these questions, she was insensitive to her rhetoric. I mean, you know, if you're a Holocaust survivor and you're reading this book, you know, book at that time, some of her uses of irony, of sarcasm. I mean, many people felt you can't talk about these issues that way. And I think that Hannah Arendt can be faulted for this. She begins the book. I mean, this is a time where uh, David Ben-Gurion is considered like Mandela in South Africa. And uh, she begins the book by talking about Ben Ben-Gurion's show trial. That's not a way to win friends. So I think that uh, she is in part complicit, I think, for some of the strong reactions. And Mary tries to press her. Weren't you aware of this? Didn't you really know this? Uh, thing? And I think, there, I think that she actually, you know, I mean, Hunter was never afraid to express her opinion. Right, wrong, I mean, she was always controversial on all kinds of issues. She was controversial on the Zionist issue because she was arguing against the Zionists. She considered herself loyal opposition. She was controversial on this I issue oh, about this. She, uh, she was not a person to modulate her views. She had strong views and she spoke them right or wrong. And they make several references in the movie to her arrogance. Um, it wasn't an arrogance of, I don't give a damn about the rest, but it was an arrogance, I've seen it, and I'm just reporting it. Remember when she says about the Jewish councils, I'm just reporting it. I mean, Sean is right, you're not just reporting. Nobody can say how many Jews would be killed if there were in councils or not. That's not a fact. So there is a sense in which she had her blindnesses. I mean, I am a great admirer of Rent, but not, not. Uh, in fact, I would like to. T can I end by telling a story about how I got to meet her? Do I have time, David? Sure. Okay. We're not leaving. We're okay. Uh, when I, I think I'm young now, but when I was younger, uh, I was not interested at all in the work of Hannah Rent. Uh, I was much more interested in Hegel and Hegelian Marxism and so forth. And I think, thought then, and still do, that some of the things she has to say about Hegel and Marx are outrageous. So I was not a fan of her. Now, at a, in 1971, I published a book called Praxis in Action. And it, it's a little bit complicated. I had done this, I did this with a local editor who I really had a lot of faith in because I was doing something, I wanted to come out in paper, and I had German quote, quote notes and so forth. But I had published an earlier book at Yale. And the editor of Yale was very indignant that I was not giving my book to her. So I sent it to her, and she took it upon herself to send it to a reader. Now this reader, I mean, it's the, uh, uh, this book, by the way, is still in print and is sold, that, that, but this reader obviously was a German exile who was very arrogant, uh, was indignant that I would discuss in the same book I'm talking about Hegel, that I would discuss Anglo-American philosophy. 
And at this time, uh, you might say there were maybe five people in the United States writing about Hegel. Why didn't I cite this German source? Why didn't I cite that? In my mind, who do I know who's an arrogant German exile? It's Hannah Arendt. In 1972, I remember exactly what it was because it was Passover. Passover, April 1972, she came. A colleague of mine in political science invited her to come to the new school to give a lecture. I mean, not the new school, Haverford College, where I was teaching in, at that time. And she says, I want to meet Richard Bernstein. I had no idea why she wanted to meet me. me, me. He, and I even remember we, we, we met in a place at the, called the Haverford Hotel. The reason she wanted to meet her, me is the editor of my book, a man by the name of Fred Week was a per friend of her, and sent her the book. And she wanted to tell me how much she liked the book. So you could imagine the mindset. I had to change my mind. It's only then that I started really reading her. Uh, and she was a great uh, uh, supporter. And this tells something else about Hannah. In my book, her book is, her fame, one of her famous books is The Human Condition, which is all about action. I have one little footnote to Hannah Arendt. That's all. That was of no interest. She felt I was trying to do something original, oh, uh, and thing. I mean, it was so. She, I was now just forty or so, and she was in her sixties. But it was the way I described it in one of the books I dedicated to her. It was we fought, we argued. We were there from eight o'clock to two o'clock in the morning arguing philosophy. And somehow there was this tremendous attraction, and she actually, I should tell you the story. In 1972, she wanted me to come to the new school. And at that time, my wife is teaching at Bryn Mawr. I'm teaching in Haverford. I have four young children. If you remember what New York was like in the 1970s, it was not a place that you would want to bring four young children if on, a, on a professor's salary. Besides, my wife is teaching at Bryn Mawr. Bryn, Bryn Mawr uh, it, it didn't work out, and thing. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, the last part of the story, I will tell. There were a few other other aspects of it because she was. Yes, I have to tell this part. This is how I met Mary. Uh, now she invites me. She says, "What are you working on?" You know, because and I had just applied for an NEH, and I was writing a book called "The Restructuring of Social Political." I hadn't written anything. I just wrote the outline for the book, but she read it. Next thing I know. I'm invited to have a Sunday brunch at the estate of William Yovanovitch up in Westchester with Mary McCarthy. Beautiful afternoon. I thought this was very lovely. There was a limousine to take us from New York up to, up to there. At the end of this lunch, he says, I want to publish your next book. And it was due to, to, I mean, I, I hadn't written a word. I said, you know, I don't want to sign a contract until I write something. But it was ultimately published uh, by them, and that was all due to Hannah uh, at that time. So she's a kind of person, you could see this when we talk about her arrogance. She was that way, and she, she didn't think, but, it was, but the other side of it was this kind of generosity and openness. I have to tell, the last part of the story I will tell because it has something with my having become dean and with getting to know many of you. Uh, I also, by the way, in 1972, knew the new school, the graduate faculty at that time was about to fall apart, as it did at the end of the 70s, you know, that we had three departments, including philosophy. The last meeting I had with Hunter Arendt was in uh, the spring of 1975. She, won she died this following December. Uh, December, and she invited me to her apartment, cooked me dinner in, very, in that, like, that little main room, very concerned that I would eat enough. And I wanted to speak to her about her years in Paris. She was obviously very agitated. She was agitated about the new school. She thought they were going to end philosophy. And she thought this was a terrible thing. Now, at this point, I'm at Haverford. I have nothing to do with the new school. We're just friends. She kept returning to that subject, but I never forgot the conversation. So when, when you were there, Henry, you heard about it, when Jonathan came and Ira came to the new school, the way they were going to rebuild the graduate faculty was to have outside experts, an enabling committee, 
to help rebuild the departments. When I was asked by Ira, this is before I'm at the new school, to be on the enabling committee to rebuild philosophy, I really felt that I was fulfilling the testament of Hannah Arendt. No thing. And we did rebuild it. Thanks to your generosity uh, and uh, your help. And that's, so, that's some of my experiences with that. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, uh, the movie. And if anybody has any questions, they will ask me now or an email. I'm happy to do it where this passage came from. Um, and so forth. I can answer all those, uh, I think most of those uh, questions. Let me just read you uh, this last. I keep saying it's the last. This really is the last. Um, Jerry Cohn was the, one of the last assist assistants of Hunter Rent at the new school and indeed has been the great preserver of her, her heritage. He is the main editor of many, many of her writings, particularly the writings that are posthumous. And so, and he was an advisor to the movie, so he knows a good deal about it. So I said to him, um, I said, granted that this is fictional, but a fine representation of Hannah, I suspect that one question that's gonna be asked is, why did Von Trotta make the new school look so bad, asking Hanna to resign? If, as we know, Hanna wasn't teaching at the new school during the Eichmann years. Was it primarily for dramatic purposes? That's me, that's my email to him, and here's his response. He says, uh, about the new school and the film, it was not Von Trotta's intention to present the new school in an unfavorable light. It's unfortunate, I believe, that the new school is more specifically identified, which ironically was meant to be a compliment, than other institutions where Hanna taught. The fact that some academics and administrators turned against her at the time of the Eichmann controversy was in the film an overview and not focused on the new school. The trustees should know that. In fact, the acrim real acrimony was at Chicago.